In this week's episode, I'm joined by Karen Catlin, author of Better Allies and Belonging in Healthcare. This week, our conversation is about young adults with autism heading to Broadway, greater diversity in medical imagery, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Let's get started. Karen, will you please introduce yourself? Oh, yes, Bernadette, it is such a pleasure to be on Five Things with you this week and um, introduce myself. So I'm Karen Catlin. I'm the author of three books on how people can be better allies in the workplace uh, for anyone who might be underrepresented based on their gender, their sexual orientation and identity, their race, ethnicity, age, abilities, and so forth. And I love focusing, too, on positive things, especially the positive actions people can take to be more inclusive. I am a huge believer that there is a role that we all can play every day at work to create that inclusive culture, which frankly is good for everyone. It helps everyone do their best work and thrive. And um, that's just my mindset is we can do this together. And I uh, I just want to say I am subscribe to your newsletter for ages now. And I love the fact that you focus on the positives because there is a lot of doom and gloom around this topic. We can get frustrated about the lack of progress on so many different topics, yet there are these gems, these these just these wonderful stories out there. And I love that you bring that out every week for your audience. Thank you so much, Karen. That's really wonderful to hear. And I will say that I am a huge fan of yours as well. I love your Better Allies newsletter, which, by the way, folks, it comes out every Friday. You can subscribe at whatbetterallies.com. And you just provide really meaningful bites that folks can do with it's something within their own power and control. And and that's what I love is, is you make this work really actionable. And so you know, when we when we keep spreading the good news and we keep making it easier for folks to to figure out where they fit into this DEI landscape, I think they start to be less intimidated by this work and less overwhelmed. And I think that a lot of folks do get overwhelmed. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about that a minute. I agree with you. It seems like there's so much to learn in this space. And how am I ever going to remember all of this and do all of this stuff? And by the way, I have a busy job and a busy life and I don't have any time for this stuff. That can be a mindset and I get it. But what you just said is we can kind of break things down and give people, and this is my goal with my newsletter, five ally actions every week. Here are five things you could consider doing next week at work, if not today. And they are things that I I do try to break it down, make it very pragmatic, very actionable, very almost simple to realize there is a step you can take to be more inclusive and it can make a difference to your coworkers in that meeting, in that hallway conversation, in that Slack conversation that's happening, in that hiring decision. There are so many things we could do every day to be more inclusive. So folks, don't get overwhelmed. You don't have to be like an expert in DEI or have those words on your business card in your job title to make a difference. You really can make a difference. Absolutely. So definitely subscribe to Karen's newsletter for practical things that everyone can do uh, to keep things sort of simple, but ongoing. I think that's what really matters. So Karen, since the last time you and I spoke, you have released a new book called Belonging in Healthcare. So why don't you give us a little bit of background on how that came about and a couple of takeaways from the book? Oh, I'd love to do that. So I published 
my first book about allyship, which is called Better Allies. I published that in 2019 and um, did a second edition in 2021. And I started hearing, especially from a few friends who are in healthcare, physicians working on patient care in administrative roles and so forth. I started hearing from them that this book, my book, who like I wrote it as a woman, former tech executive, woman working in tech, like I know nothing about healthcare, but I started hearing from friends who are in healthcare that my book was helping them, helping them on two fronts. The first front being it helped them be a better leader in their organization so that they could be more inclusive themselves. But they also hinted that it helped them give and deliver better patient care. And I was overwhelmed, Bernadette, when I got that. I'm like, oh my gosh. And this was during the, I'll call it the the beginning of the pandemic, where our frontline workers were so challenged and doing such important work. And I'm like, my gosh, people are finding my book helpful for their frontline work. I can't believe it. So anyway, I decided to write a version of Better Allies with stories and examples specifically about the healthcare workplace um, so that people who are working in, in healthcare settings can take my Better Allies approach and apply it to their workforce and their work cultures and make more inclusion in those settings. So it's, it's a version of Better Allies totally customized for healthcare. I love that. I love that. That's really, that's fascinating. And I think that there are, obviously the people in healthcare are, have a huge frontline employee base and the ability that they have, the power that they have to be able to impact patient outcomes and really the rest of someone's life um, is significant. So thank you for, for filling the void in that space and providing folks with really actionable tips who work in that industry for that industry. So let's get into uh, some of the, the the story that I, I wrote to kick off the newsletter this week, which is about a study conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is showing this paradox around remote work. So the study revealed that about two thirds of the study participants, the leaders, express concerns that remote work has adverse effects on workplace culture, team dynamics, communication, and training. We hear that, right? But on the other hand, it's important for recruitment. It's important for retention. About two thirds acknowledge that remote work is a valuable tool for retention. Over half acknowledge that it's an invaluable tool for recruitment. So because there is this paradox, it's more attractive for potential employees, especially those from underrepresented groups who may experience more microaggressions at work, but it's not being done effectively, right? So there's a, but I think the thing that is important here is that it's a fixable problem. There's something that leaders can do. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah, I loved your approach in the newsletter about this is a problem we can fix. If it is a problem around connection, like if that is the thing that's underlying the concerns around bringing people, letting people be remote, and let's face it, not all jobs can be done remote, but the ones that can, if people in leadership roles are concerned that people aren't connecting, um, you gave some very actionable I, you know, ideas. That's a fixable problem. And I think you pointed out, you know, you can spend a couple minutes at the beginning of any meeting to just have those connection points, have those icebreakers of sorts. Um, and I, I love that. But there are other things we can do too, in terms of it's a fixable problem. So what's another issue that I hear a lot of about with remote work is the um, concern about proximity bias. Proximity Mm -hmm. bias is that bias that happens when a manager or supervisor basically prefers the people they are in close proximity to, the people they see doing the work every day. They are more likely to tap them for some additional responsibility or a stretch project, right? They're more likely to consult them on something that might be going on. They're more likely to sponsor them because they see them at work every day. And there's a proximity bias that happens. So that's another fixable problem. We can make sure that there are systems in place so that um, it, things are tracked by if some people are remote and some are in the office, let's make sure that there isn't any biased activity uh, you know, over time in terms of the promotion and opportunities that people are getting. Are, pe- are they going more to people who are in the office most of the time versus the people who are remote? If that's happening, then that's something that people can do. And of course, in my work on just having people be better allies is 
be aware of that proximity bias. Check yourself if you are in a supervisory role and make sure that as you are in positions of giving out bonuses, giving out new work assignments, giving people promotions, look at that list and make sure that you're doing it equitably. It's great, great advice. And I think the more we talk about this, the more folks have that awareness, right? But what is there, so, is there something that you can re- recommend that leaders do to sort of embed embed something in their systems or structure to reduce the bias besides just sort of keeping it in mind? Well, yeah, you can definitely use your HR systems as well to track this stuff and be looking at the demographics of your workforce, your your teams, and making sure that things are, you know, you're, you're tracking who's getting the promotions, who's getting the larger bonuses, who's getting the opportunity, but do that in conjunction with your HR system. Love it. Great. Okay. Well, let's move on to this week's five things this week's good vibes the first story comes from the city of kansas city which is constructing the world's first stadium purpose built for a women's professional sports team the kansas city current of the national women's soccer league now this stadium is going to empower women's sports inspire investment in kansas city's riverfront and bring an expected one billion dollars to the economy in a pivotal moment for women's sports here in the u.s yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that uh, the momentum too of the the Barbie movie, uh, the Taylor Swift economy that's happening, women's initiatives, women's um, recreation, and so forth. It's good for the economy, and the the numbers you just quoted uh, back that up. Um, and isn't it? It's shocking that this is the world's first stadium, I the know. world's first stadium devoted to a woman's sport. So that just was sort of um, uh, at. at outstanding to me. It sort of um, surprised me. And um, so it's, it's definitely good vibes. Let's not, though, lose track of the challenges women are facing in professional sports and non-professional sports, you know, around pay equity. We, we've, I'm sure you've covered that. We've heard about that in the past. Um, it's an ongoing problem. And other things, too, like um, most recently, it, I, think, I believe it was Wimbledon with women's tennis, um, finally letting women not have to wear white bottoms, which um, is a problem for menstruating athletes at yeah. times. So um, anyway, let's let's keep in mind there's still challenges in women's sports. Yes, we covered Wimbledon earlier this summer. Wow. I mean, the things that we find to celebrate that are just progress that we shouldn't even that shouldn't even need to be right. But but here we are. Okay, here and here's another example. The second story comes from Johnson & Johnson, which launched Illustrate Change, an initiative to enhance diversity and representation in medical illustrations, which have historically represented white folks. Now, you sent me this story, so thank you for sending me this story. And by the way, I always welcome stories from readers and listeners if you find some good vibes to share. So this, this program uh, includes a diverse medical illustration library, a fellowship to support illustrators of color, and an awareness campaign for more inclusive healthcare. So right up your alley. Yeah, I know. So I mentioned this topic in my book. Of course, Johnson & Johnson hadn't done this initiative yet, so I, I didn't mention the exact initiative. But I mentioned the importance of having and sh- uh, representing diversity in images and illustrations in medical textbooks specifically, as well as training material, slide decks, and so forth. And just one example, in case like people are like, why is this a big deal? One example is Lyme disease. There are dermatology textbooks that only show Lyme disease on white skin, which, by the way, what I've learned is that Lyme disease presents itself on dark skin very differently than white skin. So there is a whole generation of dermatologists who are not learning how to diagnose Lyme disease on dark skin. That's a problem. And that's why initiatives like this Johnson and Johnson one are so important to patient care. And by the way, there are people who have said on social media, Hey, if I had seen these kind of images when I was, you know, in college, maybe being exposed to future, you know, career paths, maybe I would have decided to study medicine because those images look like people I would want to take care of. And we need more diversity in healthcare. So this is just a win on so many levels, this initiative. It absolutely is. I love it. And let's just add that Lyme disease is a horrible disease, which if it's not treated quickly can have very significant long-term health effects. So this, it's really is a matter of life and death. So thank you for sharing the story. 
Okay, the third story this week comes from Amazon, which does not make five things very often, I will admit. It expanded its fertility and family building benefits program to employees, including hourly workers in 50 countries around the world. So this has been available to U.S. employees for the past four years. So this is about um, Amazon employees can now access virtual appointments with healthcare professionals for fertility and family building guidance on topics like egg freezing and vitro fertilization, adoption, and surrogacy. Now, Amazon is not covering the cost of those procedures, but they're at least giving employees that information at no cost. Yeah. I'll yeah. take it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'll take it. Um, and it's another thing that's just like, why does this have to be a throttle that employees decide to give as a benefit or not, but it, it, it is the case. I'm reading more and more about companies, especially for hourly workers who are offering this kind of benefit. And some of them go the next step and offer and cover the cost of some of these fertility treatments to their hourly workers. I mean, through their insurance program, they have to be opting in and probably co-paying for their insurance. But there are more and more companies doing this for hourly workers. Frankly, it is to make sure they can hire hourly workers, that they can attract these um, the hourly workers they need to deliver the services for their business. So it really is, um, in some ways, just a survival tactic for some of these companies. But it's nice when it's um, it's a you know a benefit for the workers themselves. Yeah. Exactly. And those hourly workers are often um, under benefited. <laughs> Let's just say that undervalued, underappreciated. So, you know, the little things do matter. OK, the next story comes from Broadway, which is about to debut a new documentary based musical called How to Dance in Ohio which is about young adults with autism preparing for a spring formal and has seven actors with autism in the cast. And what I love about this is that the musical tells a story about people on the cusp of the next phase of their lives, facing down hopes and fears, ready to take a momentous first step and dance. Do you know what, the, do you remember what that was like, Karen? It was hard enough without autism. I'll tell you for me. It was a long time ago for me, but <laughs> yeah, sure. Of course course, um, an awkward time in anyone's life. Yeah. Um, so you said it all. It's, um, it, it, it seems like it's a beautiful show, beautiful tribute, a beautiful um, way to showcase some talent that is um, underrepresented, I bet, in many uh, Broadway casts. Um, so actual actors who have autism playing roles of people with autism. That's the way it should be. That's that representation that is so important. And frankly, making sure that theater goers have more diversity and what kind of stuff they're seeing on, on the stage too. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that kind of representation. These beautiful stories. I mean, I just got goosebumps just thinking about it. I mean, it's these, we all have stories to tell. And I just love that these types of stories are, are making their way to Broadway. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. The last story for this week's five things comes from Delta Airlines, one of my favorite companies to follow, which has really put a lot of effort into successful upskilling programs, including the Delta Analytics Academy and an Earn While You Learn apprenticeship program designed to open up higher paying job opportunities for current employees without degrees who are in lower level positions. So it's really a great way to build their own internal pipeline to build retention, all of this great stuff. Yeah. And that college degree thing, I just want to hone that. I have a college degree. I, am, I know it's helped me with my career. It, it taught me valuable skills. I still tap into them today. But a lot of people don't have the opportunity to go to college. Um, I learned from Minda Hartz in her book, The Memo, which is fabulous. Uh, but one thing she pointed out is that many students of color in the United States are guided to either not pursue a four-year college education or go to a community college. They're guided that way by their guidance counselors. And instead, there are many white people who are encouraged to go to college by their family and by guidance counselors who have some bias perhaps at play. So this whole notion of who gets ahead because of their college degrees, I think, is a 
is something we need to address. And I love that Delta is doing this with their apprenticeship program. And I think you know, through the lens of better allies, people out there listening, if you are involved at all in hiring, if you are involved at all with reviewing job descriptions or writing them yourselves because you're the hiring manager, think closely and carefully about whether you need a college degree or not. And if you don't, if it is not required to do the job, consider taking it out. Um, there's so many companies on this trend right now, and I love the fact that they are opening the doors for a lot more people to apply and chances are have a very successful career in that role. Absolutely, Karen. And when other companies continue to do it or when I hear about it, you can bet I will talk about it here on Five Things. <laughs> Thank you for teeing me up for that. Uh, I always try to fit in that line somewhere. So <laughs> that was a great tee up. Karen, thank you so much for joining me this week. I really appreciate the great conversation and what you do every week in your Better Allies newsletter. So how, how can folks get in touch with you? Yeah, betterallies.com has all the information, excuse me. <clears throat> and I encourage you to check out my newsletter, but Better Allies is also on LinkedIn, excuse me, on Instagram, on X, formerly known as Twitter, on threads. And you can follow me, Karen Catlin, on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, Karen, it has been an absolute pleasure. And for folks listening, the other call to action for this week is to follow Toby Milden on LinkedIn. He has also been a guest here on the show in the past, and he has some really wonderful, insightful posts, particularly about disability and inclusion. So we'll make sure we put Toby's link in the show notes as well. Lots of great reads for you here. Karen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye. And if you don't already get the Five Things newsletter, you can subscribe at fivethingsdei.com. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for five things in 15 minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI 